Um, and um, I think the way we'll do it as we've done, we'll kind of break it into, into pieces. I need maybe someone 5 to 11 and then 12 to 18 and then 19 to 24. So maybe three good readers who'd be willing. I've got Bruce. Uh, and Bruce, I'll have you do 5 to, to 11. Um, who can do 12 to 18? Who'd be willing to read that for us, verses 12 to 18? All right, I got Jerry, and then one more person, verses 19 through 24. Who'd be willing to read verses 19 through 24? Any volunteers? All right, Jim. Let's go ahead and, uh, so Bruce, would you start, then Jerry, and then Jim to finish us out. All right, so um, I'm going to give you a couple minutes. And Haley, if you put up the next slide, uh, I don't know about you, but when you hear these closing words, it almost feels a little bit like an afterthought to the letter because the letter to the Corinthians has worked through some really in-depth theological ideas. We've talked about well, the meaning of the resurrection, and we've talked about um, the use of spiritual gifts, and there's that, of course, 1 Corinthians 13, that whole passage on love, and it's such lofty uh, theological stuff. And then we get to the close of the letter, and it's kind of like Paul's travel plans and a few passing on the greetings. And there's a tendency, I think, sometimes to maybe skip over this a little bit, or at least in our minds to give it um, less weight than we would to other passages in the letter. Um, but of course, we believe rightly that all of Scripture is God's word to us. And that means that this travel plan stuff and greetings and um, closing matters is every bit as spiritually important, I think, as all that other stuff. So so my question for us tonight is, what how, how does this actually minister to us today? What are and, and to do that and to get at that idea, I put up the first question, which is, as you go through this, I want you to, to circle back through and ask yourself, what are some of the deeper theological themes that might underlie these very, very practical concerns? Okay, so, so go back through. And, and then the second one, um, if you get to it, um, go to 1 Corinthians 1 verses 1 through 9. And I said way back when that we always have to look at what is the theme of the whole book? What are some of the ideas that come through? Because every passage ties to that, or at least you know, many of them do. 
And one of the ways we do is we go to the beginning of the book and you read the, the first few verses and then that gives you, um, and you can also read the end of the book and sometimes you'll see overlap between the beginning and the end or you'll see kind of a repeated idea. So I want to give you a couple minutes to go and reread one through one verses one through nine and see if that matches up with anything that you see here, any of the same themes. And then as we've done just about every other time, circle any repeated words or ideas. I didn't find as many in this case. Um, and I think maybe that's because it's more practical stuff. But um, So go back to, I'll give you maybe four or five minutes to go through that and ask yourself those questions and then we'll come back together and see if we can tie this up a little bit. Maybe about one more minute or so. Okay, let's, um, let's come back together on this and let's start with that first question. So we had a couple minutes to go through and you see very practical stuff here, Paul's travel plans and you know when he's going to revisit them and so on. But what do you see as deeper theological themes that maybe tie this together? What, what do you think? Unity, that's right. 
Yeah, because he's he's speaking, he's encouraging the church to accept and to receive um, Timothy and Apollos, and um, he also gets at the idea of family here too, doesn't he? He talks and uses family language here, which is really important for a church that was so divided. All right, good. What else? Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yeah, exactly. He needs to spend that time pastoring them for um, for a long time. He doesn't want to just kind of zip through. And um, so his real, I mean, that's his pastoral care and his, his pastoral sensitivities to the church. Yeah, absolutely good. What else? Yeah. 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 So, I tell you what. Let's let's go to this. I'm glad you brought that up, and this will tie together with what Jane said. Hey, if you go to the next map, uh, the next slide, you'll see a map. Um, Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians probably near the end of his second missionary journey when he was in Ephesus. Now, um, there's some speculation on this, but here's what I I think makes sense. Um, so you, you can, I should have got my little laser pointer, but you can kind of see on the far left corner, in fact, I'll just do this. So here's, here's Athens. He was in Athens. That's where he's on the, uh, the um, mountain speaking to the Athens. Then he travels to Corinth. He spends a little time with them there. He, um, he's there for some time. Then he heads on to Ephesus, and that's um, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 18. Now, it seems that he's only there for a very brief time. Like from the text, you almost get the sense that he barely has enough time to get off the boat and visit with the people of Ephesus. And then he, uh, but it's possible that's when he wrote the letter to the Corinthians. And the idea being that as soon as he gets off the boat, he spends a little time in Ephesus there, he gets back on and he travels down to, um, back down to Caesarea here near the bottom. This is his return to Jerusalem. That You can't see it on the map, but underneath there is Jerusalem. So he's there. Oh, yeah, good. Thank you. Um, go to the next slide. Shortly after that, he takes on um, his next missionary journey, and he this is his third journey, and then he goes eventually up to Ephesus, and that is where he spends a great deal of time. In fact, he's there for several years. And um, from what we know in Acts chapter um, 18 or and 19, um, again, it, well, Acts 19 is the lengthy time that he's there in Ephesus. Um, he's, he's able to minister quite a bit, but there's also a lot of resistance there. There's a lot of opposition. And, and yet Paul senses that God wants him there, and that's what he says here. Um, so maybe his, you know, the first time he's in Ephesus, maybe he has a sense that he's going to come back there fairly soon. And, um, and that's what he says to the Corinthians. I'm, you know, the idea being, I'm going to go back to Jerusalem, then back to Ephesus. I need to spend more time there, um, and then on back to you when I have um, ample opportunity. And it seems that a couple of years go by um, between those, uh, between that time that he's in Ephesus and the time he eventually makes it back around to Corinth. So there's that there's that sense of gospel strategy there that Paul is sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and he's seeing these doors opening but that doesn't mean that oh this is going easy it just is that sense that God is working here in spite of the opposition that he's um, that he's facing and so he continues to um, to remain there um, and he's there and and then eventually he does make it back to Corinth um, but that was probably a couple of years after he wrote the letter to the Corinthians um, and in the meantime wrote, um, other letters to them as well, so um, including the second letter to the Corinthians. So it's kind of fun if you um, if you're ever looking for a little project to do that's kind of a biblical studies project. Just try to piece together when Paul is writing these letters and where he's at and how that all fits with his journeys, at missionary journeys, because you um, there's a lot of pieces you can put together. But it's pretty interesting if you start to do that. Um, so so yeah. Anyways, um, other other themes that come out in this. Um, in this uh, section that we've looked at, uh, these underlying ideas that... Mm -hmm. Right. 
That's right. There was, and, and if, if you, you also see that, well, you're talking first about the people, uh, Timothy and Apollos and some of the other names, um, and he's commending them, those people, to the Corinthian church. Now, Haley, let's do, um, if we go, um, go to the next slide, it's slide number five. Um, Paul has specific reason for doing that. Um, the question in, in each person, he names um, at least two he spends a little time on. Um, Timothy, we don't know exactly how the Corinthians would have received Timothy, but they were a little suspicious of Paul, you remember, um, because Paul came to them and the Corinthians were sort of like, you know, some people liked Paul, but others were kind of questioned his credentials. And so if Paul sends now Timothy, who is Paul's disciple, that might be all the more reason to question Timothy. Like if, if you're sort of on the edge about Paul, then one of Paul's junior associates, you're really going to be on the edge about. That's kind of the idea. And so what Paul knows he needs to do is he needs to affirm Timothy and then commend him to the Corinthians. And that's what he's doing there. See that you put him at ease among you, right? Don't be hard on this guy and don't make him try to have to prove himself um, in, in that sense. But understand that he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. So and then he says, don't let anyone despise him. Now, Apollos... Um, Apollos raises another question. You may remember we ran into Apollos back in chapter 1 um, because that's where Paul was writing about the divisions in the church. And he says, you know, I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. And he says somewhere else, um, did uh, some follow Paul, some follow Apollos. And the idea being there, it seems that there were these factions that were loyal to different people. And the question here is, well, would the Corinthians be... Would, would, would Apollos be a divisive person? Would the Corinthians see him that way? In other words, would some of the Corinthians try to use this as an opportunity to say, hey, you know, here's our guy. He's come back. Let's, you know, follow after him. And Paul doesn't want that happening. He's already said that we can't have these divisions within the church. And so he commends Apollos to them um, to, um, to ensure that they, are, um, that they treat him well, but, um, but then that he's not going to be divisive. But he also says, this, is, this, this kind of jumped out at me, um, I strongly urged him to come and visit you, but he didn't want to come, is effectively what he says. Now, you can look at that a number of different ways, I suppose. You could look at it as, well, you know, maybe Apollos just didn't have any interest in them or whatever. But you also see there's this kind of sense that Paul respects his missionary colleague. You know, Apollos had his own reasons, and Paul was willing to honor that for the time being. Um, and why, I'm not exactly sure. Um, perhaps there's reason given or hinted at somewhere else in um, in scripture, though I'm not aware of it offhand. But the idea being, you know, they, they have this disagreement about plans, and Paul sees it one way and Apollos the other, but Paul defers to what Apollos is going to do. And then um, he, he goes on as well, and he talks about Stephanus and Achaia and uh, Fortunus. And uh, Stephanus was the first um, person to be uh, baptized, the first convert, and, and in chapter 1, verse 16, um, Paul mentions that. He says, I did baptize Stephanus. He goes back and he, he actually says, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you. But then he, it's like he almost corrects himself. I did baptize Stephanus, and I don't remember if I baptized any others of you, is, is what Paul says. Um, but the point being that Paul is recognizing, by recognizing Stephanus, he's acknowledging the first fruits of God's work among this church. So he's saying, he's kind of reminding them, hey, God has been working here for a little while now. Um, so he's he's um, kind of encouraging um, them in that. Um, yeah, Margie. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. That's right. Yeah, be subject not just to the people in formal leadership positions, but to everyone. And again, that, I'm glad you brought that out because that ties back to the theme of unity within the church, right? How do you, if you, one of the ways you don't have unity is if, if everyone's refusing to honor what other people are doing and they always insist on, you know, me, myself. And Paul is, um, he's, he's making that point there and just kind of working that in. Um, and maybe that's a good segue into that other question that I asked. If, if you had a chance to go back and read chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 or so, that's the greeting that Paul gives to the church. Um, 
do you see any connections between the beginning and the end of the book that might tie the, the themes of the whole book together? What did you come up with? Did anyone want to, th this is, I know it's a little, I'm putting on the spot a little bit more with a question like this because we didn't actually take time to read that first Corinthians 1 passage, but did any of you notice anything? That's right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah, so that idea of, of the whole body and the unity that are both at the beginning and the end. And then at the end, like you say, he gives some of those names. Good. Um, anything else? Yeah, right. Good. Well, no, I'm, that, that's good that you caught that. And also, if you go to chapter 1, like verse 2, you see that again. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. And he goes on, for those enriched in every way, you're speaking in knowledge. I mean, you, you start off reading the letter and you think you're about to get into a letter to a church that really has it all together. And you read about a chapter in and you think, wait a minute, all the things that Paul has just commended them for, it seems that they struggle with. And then when you get to the end, like you say, he's now calling them and challenging them to be holy. I think I don't think it's that Paul learned something along the way. I think what happened is that when Paul opens the letter up, he's laying the groundwork. He's, he's trying to affirm these, these gospel ideals of unity and love for one another and um, and the call to holiness, and it's that tension that we all live in as Christians. We are called to something, and yet we're not there yet because we won't be there until Jesus returns. And so he's saying, okay, on the one hand, you're called to this, and I'm going to spend the whole letter telling you that you have to live into that because you're really not doing that yet, and then at the end, I'm going to close by coming back and telling you again, now go and live this out. But you're right to note those themes of that call to holiness, that call to unity and, and love together. That's absolutely right. Um, anything else? Those are a couple of the ones that actually stood out to me. So, um. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, exactly. Let all that you do be done in love. And you can't hear that without going back to what he said three chapters before in 1 Corinthians 13. Absolutely. Um, now, you can, you can really do that for just about any book of the New Testament. Read the beginning and read the end, and just see what ideas are at the beginning and the end. And chances are pretty good that in the middle of the book, you'll find the author, whether it's Paul or James or John or Peter, um, those are the notes that he's trying to hit all throughout. And so that's, that's just kind of a little Bible study technique. I know some of you lead different Bible study groups, and that's one thing you can always do. Read the beginning and the end, or um, sometimes the top and the tail, if you will, of the, um, of the book. And that will give you some of the themes and ideas to look for. Um, let's go to um, Haley. Let's actually, um, let's go to number, slide number six. So a couple of things on the greetings that Paul gives there, starting off in uh, verse 19. So verses, verses um, 10 through about 18 are specific, um, Paul commending specific people and saying, okay, when you, you know, speak to this person and, you know, respect Timothy and receive Apollos and greet and uh, honor Stephanus. But then in verse 19 it changes, and this is, these are greetings that Paul is passing on to certain members of the church. Um, Aquila, and if you, if you read the NIV, it's Priscilla. If you read the ESV, it's Prissa. Um, those were early converts, but they were more importantly tent makers with Paul. They were the people that Paul ran a business with during the time that he was in Corinth. And so they apparently got to be very, very close. Um, all the brothers... 
Paul is then passing on the greetings from the people that he's laboring with to the Corinthian church as well. Um, greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, we don't do that often today. Um, but culturally, that was an expression of unity in the faith. That was really just a way of acknowledging that, you know, together we are family in Christ. Um, I, think, I think the best analogy or the best parallel today is the time in the service when we greet one another in, in the service at the beginning. Um, it's not an exact parallel maybe, but that time of connection is meant to be more than just you know, shake your neighbor's hand, but it's meant to be, we have fellowship together as a church. Um, and so um, that's kind of a reflection of the same idea here. Um, and then Paul says, I, gr I write this greeting with my own hand. Um, that might sound strange to us, but really in all likelihood, Paul himself did not physically write down the rest of the letter. Um, he would have had a scribe write it down for him and Paul would have been dictating it. And now as he closes, he actually takes the time to take pen in his own hand and sign it as a way of affirming that, hey, I'm, uh, you know, this is, this is my, these are my thoughts and also I'm greeting you personally. It's a way he could be as personal with them as he, as he could be. Um, and then maybe a couple last, let's go one more slide up, Haley. Um, concluding gospel themes. These are some of the, again, some more of the ideas that, um, that come up. Well, let me, let me first pause if there are any questions on anything we've touched on so far. I want to give you a chance to weigh in on anything if you'd like. All right, then. So some of these, the concluding gospel themes, we've touched on a couple of these already, but the unity of the church is the family of God, right? Paul um, all, all the brothers send you greetings. That's, again, using family language. Was, you know, there, there was more meaning to that than we might first recognize. I mean, we sometimes use family language without even really thinking about it. But that was so important because the church wasn't just a gathering of people that happened to get together on Sundays. It really was seen as your new family. In fact, a family that was um, even greater than your own immediate family in terms of the eternal connections. And so family was a big idea in that. And, and of course, unity in the family was important. And so when Paul uses that language of brothers, um, he's not meaning to exclude sisters, of course, but, um, um, but the idea being the connections within the body and within the family of Christ. Um, important for a letter where there was so much um, division. The need for the cross of Christ, verse 22, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. That sounds like a hard way to end a letter, right? It, you're, he's being pretty blunt and pretty direct, but the idea being that those who, um, those who are not loving towards the Lord have not been born of love and therefore are outside of the bounds of faith. And as harsh as it sounds, the idea is really a call to faith in Christ because the way to avoid this being cut off is through the cross. And Paul has emphasized that already in the letter much, much earlier. He's emphasized the need for the gospel and God's intent to save through the foolishness of the cross. But in rejecting that, then you stand outside of, of, um, of, of the bounds of, of the Christian faith. And so then Paul's warning is let them be accursed. Um, it's not Paul wanting people to, wanting to send people to hell, but more the idea of um, unless you respond to the gospel, um, then you are rejecting uh, God and you will be um, yourself rejected. Um, and then 22b into 23, the sustaining grace of Jesus. Our Lord come, um, original text says Maranatha, um, and then to verse 23, may the, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. That need for the ongoing sustaining grace that we all need day by day to persevere in the faith, right? We live in difficult times, we face hardship and adversity within. Uh, the Catechism tells us that it's our own flesh, it's the devil and the world that all conspire to pull us away from obedience to Jesus Christ and walking with him. And we need and we depend on the grace of Jesus each day to live in obedience to him. And so Paul is emphasizing that, that we need that grace. And then it's that urgent plea for the Lord to return. Um, because that will be, and he's touched on that in chapter 15 when he talks about the resurrection, because when the Lord returns, that will be that moment when we are free from all of the affliction and sin of this world and from bodies that break down and wear out and minds that break down and wear out and uh, bodies that succumb to sinful temptation. When Jesus returns, then we're free from all of that. 
And so Paul can emphasize that. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus hasn't answered Paul's prayer just yet, right? But we still, that's our hope today. Um, and what a hope that really is, to know that Jesus one day will return and um, deliver us from the power and the presence of sin and evil once and for all. Um, so, yeah. All right, um, let's go. Last slide. I thought I would just offer some concluding thoughts here for uh, for Sunny Slope. Um, it seemed fitting to end um, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and then that, that kind of marks Paul's conclusion. And then I thought, well, that's a good way to tie up and to then conclude these evening services. And I suppose I got to thinking, the first thought is there's there's a part of this that's, that is sad, and I, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, Sunny Slope has had evening services. As far as I can tell, I don't know if it was from the very beginning. I'm not sure about that. Some of you have been around a little longer would know that. But um, certainly for a very, very long time, and that's been a long tradition within the Christian Reformed Church. Um, the evening service has always been seen as a teaching service. So the emphasis has, at least traditionally, has been on preaching through the Heidelberg Catechism. And so th the idea being the morning service was your service that was focused on the biblical text, and then in the evening you would use the catechism to shape the, the preaching theme. So not that you're not preaching biblical in the evening, but that you're using the themes of the catechism. Um, and so, we, we, you know, in, our, in my time here anyways, we've done that. We've been through the catechism, I think, three times. I think we went through the Belgic Confession twice, and I think through the Canons of Dort once. Um, by my memory anyways. And then along the way, we've touched on a lot of other themes and ideas as we've done this. And so um, that that part makes me sad, as it does um, you as well. And so I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, but at the same time, I want to um, keep us away from the sort of cynicism that might say, you know what, nobody ever cares about the Bible anymore, and we're getting less and less hungry for God's Word. And um, I, I know that that can creep in, maybe even without us intending it, but I I don't see it that way, and I want to encourage you at least to not see it that way, and I'll tell you why. Um, there are there have been new opportunities that have opened up, or you might say new ways that members of Sunny Slope Church have taken to studying God's Word together that simply weren't a thing even, well, in our church even five years ago. Um, and broadly, more broadly in the denomination, they weren't really a thing even 20 years ago. Um, there are, there's a more emphasis on small groups. We have at present, um, you know, the numbers are probably a little out of date because the church year is ending and numbers kind of shift through the, as the year goes on. But we had, um, I believe, over 60 adult members involved in various small groups. Um, and that was, I think we had seven different groups that were meeting, and then part of that is a whole lot of little kids that are connected to these groups. Um, that we were only in, I think, year four of small groups, maybe even year three. So that's a new opportunity that has come up. It doesn't, it's not a replacement for evening services in the sense that it's still very different, but it does say that people are actually getting involved in small groups that weren't even involved in evening services. And so I guess I just want to caution us against just throwing in the towel and say, well, you see, nobody cares about studying God's Word. I'm not saying any, necessarily any one of you have that, but I know that thought can creep in. Um, and maybe that kind of segues into point number three or four up there. I guess it's number three. The um, Well, let me say first the opportunity, because um, some of you wonder, well, you know, the pastor's doing less now, um, so does he? <laughs> um, and the answer to that is, well, that's a, I mean, it's a fair question, because, you know, I serve among you, and um, I'm accountable in, to the elders, but also I think I owe it to the church to at least give an explanation because, you know, so what do you do now that you don't have to write a second service? Um, and the answer to that is that, well, there are, there's a growing visitation need. I keep thinking that that list is going to shrink and it just doesn't get any smaller. Um, and there are people that need to be visited. Um, but there are also opportunities for Sunny Slope Church to continue in the work of outreach and evangelism. And that's been something that's been a priority that our elders and council have identified in the last year or two to say, um, we want to explore more what this would look like. And so we've been kind of trying a couple of different things. We're, we're still in the pretty early stages, but a prison ministry I've shared with a couple of you. Um, and then another ministry that would be looking at um, how to engage people who are really far outside the bounds of the church, but who like to discuss different ideas related to faith and 
philosophy and culture and what does that look like to try to get them to sit down together and talk. Um, and so some of those are ideas that are in the works um, that I'm spending some time trying to um, see where they go. Um, it's a little early to tell what will become of it, but that's kind of where that is. Um, and then the other thing, the council identified leadership development and training as an important priority. We've got a new council this year and we have a few uh, the largest number that I can remember of council members who have never served on Sunny Slope Council before, and a number of them who've never served on council anywhere before. Um, and then when we look at last year's council, there was a few that, now this is their second year serving in leadership. Until now, we've done very, very little to train them. And the reason is because we really haven't needed to because people have served on council and then they go off and then a couple of years later, they're back on again. And so we've, they've just kind of known how it works. But we said, if we want to recruit and attract good leaders and keep them, we need to make sure that we're training them well. And so we're trying to invest in that as well as training small group leaders, mentoring leaders, Wednesday night family night leaders, um, and others. Um, so some of that or a lot, large part of that has been what I've been investing myself in. And then I guess that, that does lead to the third point there, which is the encouragement. Um, and that's to say that there are opportunities yet for you to of course, study God's Word, I mean, in addition to the morning service. Um, you know, small groups are an option, and I'd encourage you at least to, if you're not in that and you're at least interested, take a look at, at being a part of that. I'm considering, and feel free to let me know, but I'm considering picking up something like the format we've been using here for our Wednesday night family night discussion times. Every family night, I've led a group, and it's been different topics, but um, for those of you that have enjoyed just breaking down the text and working through it, I'm thinking that we might be able to pick that up come uh, come the fall. So it's just an idea at this point, but if that's something that you definitely would want to be involved in, then let me know that. That'll kind of help move the needle one way or the other, because um, I know that this study time is um, is valued. So anyways, with that, let's, um, let's pray together, and then we'll uh, conclude our service.